Um, I do want to tell you this. I usually, I don't think I've ever said this, but if you have a paper, if you ever do take notes, I think this is where you would want to. So I'm going to give you time if you want to wrestle through um, to find a piece of paper, borrow a pen from your neighbor, um, even go to a class if you really need one. So I'm, I want to give you a, a couple of things, maybe a few things that I want you to take with you. Um, that may help you. Because to be honest, this topic that I'm going to talk about is probably one of the most important ones that you will ever hear. So I'm so glad. Thank you. So I'm so glad that um, you're here today. Because I think it's a big deal. Amen. Yeah. It's a big deal. It's a blessing. We it's it is a blessing when we have a commitment to the house of God and to hearing the word of God, right? We grow. And so um, this is one of those messages that um, is vital to your life as a Christian. Um, it's not because I'm saying it or it's this, I put this great message together. To be honest, I just did it <coughs> yesterday all day long. I had to cancel some things because I was like, all I had was yesterday and we were kind of a uh, little bit late notice and trying to figure things out. Junior's in Columbus today. Um, like Sylvester said, um, kind of passing that mantle, and we're so grateful for that. And I, um, as soon as we're concluded, Sylvester is going to kind of take charge of y'all, and um, me and Grace are going to run. So it's not that we're being rude. We just want to meet up with them um, at the end if we, if all, at all possible and be with them in that. So um, I'm going to be in 1 John 2, 9 through 11. Is going to be my main text. Amen. I'm going to read it to you. It says, Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. So today I want to talk to you about unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. And I struggle with teaching this topic. I wasn't really fan to do it because of its complexity. For one, how in the world am I going to fit all the natures of forgiveness and unforgiveness into one message? And the truth is, is that I can't. And so I'm going to give you this um, introduction to it and let you take it away, which is why I say, you know, you may want to write something down. Um, there is a variety of sins that have been done against us. There's a level, different levels of hurts that have happened. Um, so I, I understand its complexity. Um, I am fully aware as when I said unforgiveness that someone's face popped into your head and your heart became guarded and your mind anxious. I am fully aware of that. Um, it is a comp complex topic and I don't expect you to, although you could, by the power of God, just have healing at the end of the sermon. This, that could happen. But for many of you, you may have to uh, go through a process with this, but I want to get you started because of how important it is. Um, I have worked with people for months, and I'm imagining, you know, I've only been doing this for a couple of years full time now, so I imagine that I will probably walk with people for years in the pain that other people have caused them. I mean, it's, it's, but the reason I want to bring this up to the forefront is a lot of clinical diagnoses like depression, like obsessive compulsive disorders, like anxiety, like, um, you know, all of these things at the end of the day, after months of working with people, a lot of times it just comes down to unforgiveness in the heart. Yeah. Come on. So instead of, you know, this diagnostic manual, I'm like, oh, okay. Right? It's a biblical method, and this is why I think it's so important, because of the havoc that it wreaks on the body of Christ, on our actual physical body, our mind, and our spirit, and our relationship with others, and our relationship with God. Yeah. Right? 
So it causes a big, big influence. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Let us throw aside every weight that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us and run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We want to be free from it, right? It entangles us. It, it weighs us. And the sin that... Um, the race marked out for us, it becomes a weight and a sin that wreaks havoc on us. So I want to walk you through this scripture, and there's a million of them. I had six extra pages of just scripture on this topic that I had to, like, uh, let go because I knew I wouldn't have time. So, like I said, just continue to research this for yourself. This is the main scripture I'm going to use. It says, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. When I felt like the Lord wanted me to talk about forgiveness, I thought and told him, but it's so messy and complex. I don't even know, I don't think I have the right to talk about it because I don't know if I have it figured out. And so it's a really, it's just a really complex topic. And this is what I felt him speak to my heart. The reason forgiveness is so complex for Christians is because we don't understand it for ourselves. We don't really understand the gospel is our first thing. The verse says, anyone who claims to be in the light. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Right? To show forgiveness means there is a deep understanding of the gospel for yourself. Jesus uses the parable of the unmerciful servant to demonstrate how he sees unforgiveness in light of us knowing the gospel. And I'm going to read it to you. It's Matthew 18, 21 through 35. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with the servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay you back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Right? It's a sobering message, right? A servant owes an unpayable amount of, of debt to a king. If you research that, it was actually, a lot of commentaries said it was around seven billion, you know, people use billions of dollars, billions of dollars that he owed the king, right? So what he was saying, it was unpayable. That's that word. <laughs> unpayable. He could never, in however many lifetimes, he could not pay the king back. Does that sound familiar to you? <coughs> There is nothing that we can do to pay for the sins that we have sinned against God. It is, we, it is unpayable. <laughs> we, there's nothing that we can do to pay those, those things back. God 
by his graciousness, we have come to him and said, have mercy on me. And he says, and he forgives it, right? There would be no way even the wealthiest person would be able to pay back the debt in their lifetime. He was facing losing all that he had. The servant asked for mercy from his master, and the king takes pity on him, shows compassion to him, and wipes away all his debt. But the story shows that there was no revival of his heart and how he looked at this mercy. How grateful he was for his forgiveness, understanding I owe a lot too. Because when someone owed him a debt, that was, if you compare it, the other servant's debt was only about four or five months' wages, which means he could have paid it back. It was smaller than that, right? So a lot smaller than his own debt he owed. He was not merciful to him. It doesn't make sense. And that is what we look like when we won't forgive and still demand that other people pay for their wrongs. And it's sobering, right? If we refuse to forgive others, we will not be forgiven. Because of the very nature of this, we cannot possibly understand the gospel and the whole reason Jesus came. God's forgiveness has been freely given to us. Freely. And we must be willing to do the same with one another. And we pray it, right? The Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Because what it is, is it comes through us, the gospel, and the recognition of our depravity, and the gratefulness for the mercy of God. It comes through us, and it flows straight out from us. And we are then merciful to others. It flows to us and through us as living in the light of the gospel. Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. And my heading on this part in my Bible says, Living as children of the light. Don't forget, we're in the light. We've been called out of darkness. We're in the light. Come on. Amen. It says, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Every form? I probably have some forms that I have not, have not even formed yet. Right? Every form. Every form that comes up for you. However that displays for you. Because I'm going to be real honest. Some unforgiveness is very quiet. It may not be fighting. It may be just... Yeah. It may sit in your stomach. Right? I've had that where I've seen somebody in the pit of my stomach. Right? It's unforgiveness. Right there along with y'all. That's why I'm teaching this. It applies to us. It says, still Ephesians 4, 31 through 32, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Come on. So in this message, maybe this is what I want to do, is kind of help you make a little checklist when these feelings come up, because they will come up. Oh, yeah. They will. We are in a broken world. I mean, well, I think I told the story last time. What comes to me is like splitter bond. And just, I'm like, I mean, we wrestle H-E-D, you know? I mean, they're like, it's a crazy world. Driving, driving gets me. I'm like, right? All these forms come out when I'm driving, right? The Bible says do away with those things. So I kind of want to make, help you with the checklist when these feelings come up. And, and I want you to use these questions to investigate what's going on, okay? So I want you to write, one, do I understand the gospel? Have I been reflecting and meditating on the gospel? And that's going to help you. When, when you see that brother or that sister, <coughs> someone that has wronged you, um, someone, y'all, it's going to happen here too in church. I think it probably happens the most because the enemy wants nothing more to, than to cause division and offense, right? That's, that's where he gets it. So it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It will happen before the day's over maybe. We have to wrestle with it. So when that time comes, I want you to say, do I understand the gospel? And I want you to make a checklist of these. 
have I been thinking about the gospel and God's mercy on me? And that's going to help you see your brother and sister differently, right? Do I need to spend some time reflecting on and thanking God for the great mercy that I have been shown? Back to our main verse. Then it says, whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing to make him stumble. Wow, I'm going to live like that. Nothing can cause me to stumble. Right? Living in the light of the gospel and walking in God's great mercy and mercy for others will prevent you from stumbling. Now, if you study this, the language, the same language can be used for making other people stumble as well. Right? What are we known for? Love. Right? So if other people stumble when we say we're a Christian and we won't and we have unforgiveness or we have malice towards somebody, right? We cause other people to stumble like that because they're like, wait, I don't understand your God, you know? And so we, we have it that way too, causing other people to stumble. But it's also for us. And now I think where we get mixed up about forgiveness is the Bible says not to love evil. Right? We don't go and hug it and pet it and play with it and, you know, um, all of these things for others. We stay away from it. The Bible says do not love the things of this world. It is not loving to easily allow people to sin against you. Right? So, I mean, when you're loving others, we're not loving evil. Right? We're seeing them in the light of the gospel. Right? And that they need a Savior, Jesus, just like we did. So I think that's where we kind of get mixed up about forgiveness. It is not loving to allow yourself or others to be abused. Okay? So that's another message that but I did want to bring that up. The Bible is very clear about boundaries and even excommunication. Set them outside the church. It says why? Because that's loving. For them to find out that there's a God in head hit that is just, right? So, I mean, there's, there's things to that. So that they will repent. It's for their best interest. We don't want to enable people to sin. That's not what I'm saying. They can do that on their own. Love is not watching as people go to hell or enter into bondage. That's not love. Y'all, you have to know your word. Satan uses scripture and he twists it. He twists the context, right? Amen. So learn your word, all of it. Satan came to Jesus and he said, the Bible says, basically, right? But then Jesus knew another scripture. We have to know the whole of scripture. That's, that's for you to do. Forgiveness is not necessarily relational, in so, and in some cases should not be. There are people that have no malice in my heart about, I will absolutely not be in relationship with them. It is not good. It is not healthy. In some cases, it is unsafe for me. Yeah. Forgiveness does not mean you should be in relationships. That's not what it is, and I think we get... Um, confused about that. Right? Proverbs 22, 24 says, Do not make friends with that hot-tempered man. Do not associate with anyone easily angered. Right? 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Right. Amen. So you're not loving evil, evil. You're not embracing evil. What you're doing is you are walking in the light of the gospel, yeah. seeing that those people need the Lord, and you are loving them, and you are praying for them. Amen. Just yeah. like you needed, right? But unforgiveness in your heart will cause you to stumble. <clears throat> what happens is, is unforgiveness causes sin. It causes you to come right back into the darkness and be in the same sin that maybe your offender is in as well, right? What does it cause? It causes resentment in your heart. You get mad if the person who offended you is doing good. You get bitter about it. You get resentful, right? Because unforgiveness will cause you to sin. You end up in judgment. You focus on the wrongs that they're doing, right? You start to condemn and have contempt for people. You can't look over anything they do now. You just look down on them, right? Kind of arrogant, as if you haven't been in that same position needing God's mercy, right? You have envy if the person has something you want, or they don't deserve that. That's not fair, right? It's causing you to stumble, causing you to sin. You become vengeful hoping something goes wrong for them. 
That's not living in the light. This is what unforgiveness does. You slander them. You start telling every person you can think of everything bad about them to make sure no one likes them. Right? You end up in pride. You elevate yourself higher than the person, considering them less deserving of forgiveness than you are. You end up in bitterness, feeling weighed down with unresolved anger. So, unforgiveness causes us to stumble and us to end up in sin as well. And God doesn't want that. He wants us to be in the light and free. And I could go on about the things that it causes, right? Some of y'all may have some things in your mind. But unforgiveness will cause you to stumble and be in sin yourself. And I know this is a question. Well, what if they don't repent or apologize? You will not always get an apology. Someone will not always get saved. And you will not always get to celebrate and like, oh, they've been forgiven and they're a changed person. That's not always going to happen. Forgiveness of others have nothing to do with repentance to you. You can choose to forgive on your own without that person. Like I said, some people you should not even talk to about it. When, you know, sometimes you want to say, like, I need to go to that person and say, I forgive you. No, you don't. No, you don't. If you need to go to someone, it's because you need to apologize. If you don't have something to apologize for, you can forgive on your own yes. without that person. Yes. Okay? You can ask the Lord to heal your heart without that person. Ultimately, all sin is against God. Forgiveness is not based on what they deserve, just like with us, but the repentance they must make is between them and God. So forgiveness is not letting people off the hook. It is moving people off your hook to God's hook. Right? You appreciate that little fishing. I tried to find another word. I wasn't a fan. I wasn't a fan. But for you fishermen, remember, you just move them. I'm going to move them. They're heavy on my hook. I'm going to move them to the Lord's hook. I'm not saying condoning it and what they did is not right, but I'm going to give them over to the Lord. Yeah. I'm going to trade them out. If he wants to uh, catch that whale that ate Jonah with his hook, then that's up to him. <laughs> but if he wants to take them off and come over here and clean them up, then that's up to him too. Amen. So we give it over. Which brings up a second thing you can write down to look at if you feel that hurt coming up for you. Am I trusting God? When that comes up for you, that, that unforgiveness, that feeling in your stomach that you get, am I trusting God? So one, do I understand the mercy? Do I need to meditate on the mercy that I have received? And two, am I trusting God? Forgiveness is not circumventing God's justice. When Jesus died, man, it was this wholeness of justice and mercy, right? It was this beautiful picture of all, of all things. So it's not circumventing God's justice. It's allowing God to execute his justice in his time and in his way. Because we all deserved different things than what we have, right? So we're allowing God to do that. Years ago, Junior and I struggled with a Christian who was still living in the Oakham, so it's been over 10 years, okay? We worked up. Because I remember what we would do. We would be so frustrated because we're like, what they're doing is not right. And so what we started doing is we started complaining to each other, right? That's what we do, right? Like, oh, can you believe? Oh, not, it wasn't no, oh, the Lord, look at what he did, you know? And so we found ourselves complaining and the Lord showed us uh, Romans 14, 4. And we started to say it to each other. As soon as someone wanted to complain, we started to say this back and forth to each other. We still use this to this day. It has been a staple in our home because, you know, things happen. It says, Romans 14, 4, Who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. And so anytime that would rise up and we would get frustrated or aggravated, like I would say, like, oh, and he would say, Who are you to judge another man's servant? It is to his master that he's going to rise or fall. That is God's business. That is God's business. And it will be to God that that person will find forgiveness and hope and healing or he will fall. Right? Yeah. And that's been so helpful for us. 
God is a righteous judge, but let me tell you, we are not. We are not, because we will go by our feelings. We do not love people the way the Lord loves them. And we will judge harshly. Right? We are not. God is righteous. He will know what to do. And when you start thinking about them standing before a righteous God, you will start to feel compassion for them. Right? Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. This will make you pray for those who have wronged you. Understanding that they're going to stand before the Lord. Um, shortly after I got saved, the Lord showed me this. He gave me this principle, and I'm so grateful for it. Um, we were, so when I got saved, I've uh, done a lot of wrong, by the way. We won't make a list. But when I got saved, um, I, had, I had done a lot of things wrong, right? And so I... Uh, over time, in the wisdom of God, had went to some people and said, like, hey, like, this was so wrong to me. I did this. I just want to tell you. I mean, it went very well for the people, not everybody, but for the people that I could. Uh, went very well, but there was this one person. There was this one person I will never forget. And this was probably, gosh, I don't know, when we, 06, so, so I don't know. And I remember where I was. I remember, here I am saved, walking in the light, and I remember passing the HEV where Kathy's is and the HEV gas pumps right here, and I drove past her, and I remember having that feeling in my stomach, that knot in my stomach. And I had, was walking in the light. I was so Things were so different for me, and when I felt that feeling, the Lord said, I said, dang, that one person thought I had it together, right? And it was a knot in my stomach. And, you know, I was, um, man, experiencing the, just the mercy of God and his goodness. And I would, like, Isaac was real little, and I would go put him to bed, and I would pray. I would pray on the couch, and I remember, like, I mean, I was always praying, um, just hearing from the Lord all the time. You know how when you're kind of fresh, right, the Lord's just speaking to you, right? And then as you get older, you're like, with these new newbies that come in, you're like, I've been going through trials. Um, so I was in kind of that moment, and I remember kneeling down to pray, and the Lord said, do not ask me anything. Hmm. Do not ask me anything. You have something. There is something in between me and you. And until you take care of it, do not ask me for a thing. Wow. And I remember, like, thinking, what? Like, and I could feel this thickness, this wall, as I would pray. And it was, like, it was just hit the ceiling. And I could feel it, and it was so frustrating, but I knew what it was. He showed me. And so every, I would try to pray again. Nope, like hitting the ceiling. Don't ask me anything. I need you to take care of this. And so what I started doing, because I had no other choice, to be honest, I didn't want to. I did not want to. I felt like I did not owe, just, she did not deserve forgiveness. I mean, I just, it was just one of those things. So I did not want to, so I literally went to the Lord, y'all. He has forgiven me. I literally went to the Lord, and I was like, I pray for her. Hope she does good. Even though I didn't feel it, even though I didn't want it. So I started doing that. I did that for a week because every time I came to the Lord, like hitting a wall. So that's all I could do with him is pray for her. And by the end of that week, it only took a week, thank God, by the end of that week, I remember kneeling down and doing the same thing with the same attitude, but I began to weep for her. I began to weep for her. My heart was softened for her. I like, I just felt the weight of her being unsaved. I felt the weight of the gospel and his, his mercy that he has for people. And I was able to pray for her, actually, for real, in my heart, right? But it was a process. And let me tell you what happened. Of course, this is what happened. So we were probably going to church together at that time. But we were in this little room. I probably knew what I'm talking about. We were in this little room. And um, Eddie would do a little Bible study in that in our River Life where that little thing would close. And Eddie would do a little Bible study. And we, we were there faithfully. And um, so it was just a few of us. And I remember sitting there. And it was probably that week after. And I remember sitting there hearing it. And she walked in the door. 
which is unheard of, y'all. This person should not have walked in the door. And um, she walked in the door, and I, I had to excuse myself because I was so overcome with how the Lord sees his people. Not even his people, all people. Amen. Right? We have to walk in the light of the gospel, the same one that we have received. And we have to trust God and what he wants to do. And I found out very clearly that it did not matter how I felt about that person, that God loved her. Right? We have to wrestle with this. We have to wrestle with this. And another avenue of unforgiveness, we can say like, oh, yeah, no, I'm good. But maybe you're not. Right? Please don't, the Bible says God hates pretension. Be honest with him. Go to him with your little attitude, your little sneaking attitude, and say, I'm going to say this. I'm going to be obedient, but I don't feel it. And I'm going to have an attitude about it. He'll let you, he'll let you grow with it. Right? Go to him with it, though. Go to him and deal with, with how you're feeling. God didn't choose to punish her. I would have. That's why I don't get to be the judge, because I am not righteous. Come on. Amen. Amen. This showed his love for her and that she had every right to access his forgiveness just as much as I did. Live in the light of the gospel and trust God to judge righteously. And the last part of our verse. It says, But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. This is what happens to us when we don't live in light of the gospel. And sometimes that means not wrestling with our feelings too, right? Just ignoring it. Don't ignore your feelings. There's, feelings are not facts, but they are symptoms of a fact, right? They're symptoms of something that's going on. So they're good indicators. So sometimes that means not wrestling with our feelings and noticing that we have bitterness in our heart. What does it say? It blinds us. It blinds us. Now, I brought my glasses. I have just recently um, admitted to the fact that I am aging. <laughs> so these are actually my real reader glasses. I almost grabbed them. I was like, oh, I have them because I've been refusing them. And so I almost grabbed them to read uh, in the Bible. But I can see clear, right? Because they're, they're just little readers because I'm not that old. I don't need glasses. Glasses, just the cute ones that you buy. And so I can see clear, right? They magnify. I can see clear. I can see what's in front of me. I can read better. I can do better, right? So, but what does it say? It says that it blinds us. So in therapy, I use CBT, which is cognitive behavioral um, theory. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about that. <clears throat> the gist of it is how you think determines how you feel which determines how you behave, right? And somewhere along the line, I teach something similar to this, what I'm going to tell you, in that what lens you look through is what you're going to see, right? This will be your perspective, whatever lens you're looking through. And this is how it applies to this verse. <clears throat> Darkness blinds us. We cannot see clearly. I think besides not being forgiven yourself, because that's pretty huge as we found out, what's the worst thing for Christians who have unforgiveness in their heart is the dark lens they look through now that they've been hurt. <clears throat> it changes the trajectory of our lives. When people hurt us, it doesn't matter whatever people don't, right? Because, why? I think we're feeling suspicious. Right? It blinds us. People hurt us. We can be somewhere where people don't hurt us. Doesn't matter. We're blinded. We're in the dark. I swore I would never get married because of the hurt and the chaos that I saw. What if Junior came around and I missed an opportunity? Right? Why? Because darkness blinds you. You don't see out of the clear perspective. You don't see out of the light of the gospel. You see, right? You see out of the hurt and what people did to you and the bitterness 
and you start to see people like that, you start to see situations like that. <clears throat> what does this say? Whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. This is what happens with unforgiveness. Man, it, it, it wreaks havoc on you. It's, it makes you, causes you to see things differently. We look through the lens of the experiences that we have instead of the truth of God's word. Whoever has hate, has bitterness, has been hurt so bad and they just can't let it go is in the darkness and he walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Relationships, right? Let me tell you, young people, there are many a people that sit across from me that have been married for years and years and years and they are still dealing with what happened to them when they were younger, right? Because why? Because then you have trouble in your relationships and then you have trouble in, in, at your work and all of these things. This is what it does to you. Other people trying to love us, right? <clears throat> the way then we raise our children, Right? The way we honk at people? No comment. <laughs> right? Because something's already in there that has not been resolved. Yes. I always say, what you're fighting about is not what you're fighting about. Go a little bit deeper. Go a little bit deeper. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but God has come to give life fully, not through the lens of that hurt. I want you to be free, right? And see clearly. The other day I had a moment. Because that's what happened. Of course, while I was studying forgiveness and thinking about it, that's when it happens, right? I was like, that's why sometimes we don't want to speak on a certain topic. But man, let me tell you, I do not come for much. I just don't. And I honestly did not think that it could get much more than that. But let me tell you, it always is surprising. Right. Stuff happens even greater than you can think. Yeah. And I was proved wrong that there could be more, that there could be something else. And I told a friend, how can I, with one more thing, live a life and be completely free with the hand that I have been dealt? And I was kind of frustrated, right? And she said, this is why you need a friend that knows the word. And she said, sister, not to be cheesy. <clears throat> That's what she said, not to be cheesy. But this is exactly like a story from the Bible. Exactly. After I threw a little fit, I don't want to read a story from the Bible. <laughs> this is exactly, your story is exactly like the one we would read in the Bible. It is a testimony of God's faithfulness. We can do this. We can look at it like this and say, man, I, how can I come from this? How can I come from this type of lineage? How can I, but how can I make these things straight? How can I do this? And we can say, the word of God says, the word of God says, I will take you from this place and I will change you and I will, I will bless your lineage and I will, you know, all of these things. And we can see it in light of what the word says, right? Every blow can be proof of God's greatness in our life. What perspective are you going to look at it? You can use it as a testimony. Maybe not right away. I'm not ready to use it. Maybe not right away. But one day God is going to use that as a testimony to his goodness and his faithfulness and how he was always there and he always came through. God does it. We have to let it go. Or the pain, the unforgiveness will have us not being able to walk in the goodness of God and living in peace knowing that he will make things right. 
We have to step into the light, letting go of the sin that would so easily entangle us by the brokenness around us so that we will not stay in darkness. Forgiveness is not ignoring your anger or hurt. You, in fact, you need to pick one person to talk to about it. Right? <laughs> Don't get into sin and put it on Facebook. <laughs> or go tell everybody about it. You need someone healthy to go and talk to about it. Right? It can be a spouse. It can be a friend. Um, it can be a counselor. It's not ignoring your anger or hurt. It's resolving your anger and hurt by working through it and releasing the offense to God. And I know I cannot teach a well-rounded teaching on all the aspects of forgiveness. I know there's so much more um, that you may have questions about on what to do and how to do it. And there's so many different situations. But I do not want to leave without giving you some direction. And then you'll have to take the steps from there. You know the scripture and what God commands, but now it has to be walked out. And that's a process sometimes. So, I'm just going to give you a few things. One, some things you're going to have to be intentional to let go. Yeah. It's just part of it's just part of it. It's just part of being in this world. You're just going to have to be intentional about letting some things go. I'm talking about the smaller things. An attitude, right? Sometimes we get an attitude with people. Maybe it's a personality, like this justice mentality. There's a big possibility that you're looking through a lens of what others have said and done, right? It may come from somewhere else, not, not from the person that you're offended at. I always, I teach, if you have this huge feeling about something that should be small, always ask yourself, where have I felt this feeling before? Right? And trace it back to where the root really is. But we have to be intentional about letting lots of things go. And I'll share a secret. This is what I do. Y'all might make fun of me, but that's okay. Because i got to do what i got to do. I imagine myself like a duck. You know the saying? Like, it's like water off a duck's back. Am I, am I just too old? <laughs> It's like water off, you know how they say, like, water just streams off and stuff. I literally imagine in my head when something is said or something is done because it will be. And I literally, like, I'll hear it and I'll see myself, it rolls off. And sometimes, for good measure, if I'm like, really, I'm like, boop, you know, <laughs> let it roll off. I imagine myself like that because I know myself and I cannot take it in here because I will stew on it. And I want to go talk to that person. And all these things, you know. And so I, so that's what I have to do. You figure out what you need to do. You can still that if you want. Call yourself a dead. So that's one thing that I do. If you find yourself getting frustrated with things like this, I recommend John Bevere's book. Um, it's called um, The Bait of Satan. It's about offense. It's actually free. There's an app. Uh, it's like it has an X on it. I think it's called Messenger, and you, you literally can have it free on there. Everyone should read that, honestly, because Satan, that is the bait of Satan: offense and unforgiveness. Um, he uses it, right? Um, but that is for relationships, like in the church, work, marriage. Come on, marriage, relationships, close relationships. You have to. You have to constantly be forgiving. Now, I know just by statistics alone that many of you in the room have been hurt way more than some flippant words, right? Um, you're going to have to wrestle with it. You're going to have to wrestle with it. You are going to have to be honest with God and be obedient to forgive while you wrestle with all the feelings. Um, that are going to come up. Um, there are two parts. I know at least it's our curse. She says there's two parts to forgiveness. One is the obedience, where you forgive what actually happened, and then another part is actually dealing with the impact that that action helped, that action had on your life. And sometimes that is a long process, right? You can go to counseling. 
because grief a lot of times involves, right? It's very complex. All the parts that come along with it, so you can be free. I have plenty of resources to help you with that. I can refer you somewhere. I can get get with me. Um, sometimes it's it's you got to wrestle with it. Um, I highly recommend Lisa Turkhurst's book. It's called Forgiving What You Cannot Forget. I use that book in clinical practice with people that are dealing with pain and, and things that have happened to them. But it is very good. I highly recommend it. Forgiving What You Cannot Forget uh, by Lisa Turkers. Um, forgiveness and healing has to take place. And then are, if you are confused or tend to mix up forgiveness with allowing people to sin against you or enabling them or keeping a trying to keep a relationship with them, then I highly recommend a book by another book by Lisa Turkers that's called Good Boundaries and Good Buys. There are some people that you need to say goodbye to. There are some people that you need to have good boundaries with. Um, so there, this is all kinds of different things that we have to do. Forgiveness does not mean we should be in relationship with the people we forgive, or have an open door of access to allow them to stay in sin. Okay, so that's just kind of a start for you. Um, you know, part of this may be you write some a person's initials down. You know, sometimes it's kind of scary to write their full name. In my message, I didn't write that girl's full name. I wrote her initials, even though I very much knew who she was. Um, you know, maybe you want to write it down. I think we did that with that. You know, we put it on the cross. I mean, sometimes we have to do um, an action. We have to take an actual physical action that symbolizes, hey, we're forgiving. Hey, we're, I'm forgiving. Every time that thought comes up, I'm forgiving. I'm forgiving. And, and so there's in those books, there's some methods to um, some processes for you. But I just wanted to get you started knowing how important this is, how extremely important this is, when you live in light of the gospel. Amen. Amen. Um, give them over to the Lord and then whatever process you need to do, do it. Do it. We're commanded to do it, but it's also, you want to live free. You want to live free. You don't want to raise your family. You don't want to um, live your life through the pain that someone has caused you. They've already taken something, right? Don't give them the rest of it. That's right. You know, so there's some resources there. Um, and let's pray. And I'm going to, we do have a few minutes. I'm going to, I'm just going to open the altar for you to, you know, so some of y'all, maybe someone came to your mind. Um, I just want you to physically come and just, I mean, just pretend that you're placing them. Just show but you're placing them. Lord, I'm giving them to you. The feelings are not all going to go away. That's going to be a process. But out of obedience that we are to forgive others, whatever that's going to look like for you, I want you to come, place them at the altar, change them from your hook to God's hook, change the weight <coughs> from your boat to God's boat, however you want to look at it, and move them over and start working on that. Start being free from that, but start by being obedient to God. Amen.